Okay, Frumley, go ahead, strap in, because just like episode four, we're not gonna waste any time. We're back in the thick of it with Tabitha, Henry, and that damn tree in the road. This episode is titled, There and Back Again, which absolutely makes sense as Tabitha made it out of From Town, just to end up back in From. Interestingly enough, this term is typically associated with the J.R.R. Tolkien novel, The Hobbit. In the story, Bilbo Baggins embarks on an adventure, but ultimately returns home. The phrase perfectly captures this journey where Tabitha ventured to Camden, Maine, and then made her way back to where she started in From Town. But first, before we dive into the insanity that From keeps just throwing at us, do me a favor. Smash that like button like you're smashing those theories together. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Trust me, you don't want to miss any of the twists, turns, and theories that we're about to dive into. Plus, if you don't, you might end up as one of those people creature monsters next snap. So let's just go ahead and get into it. Now, for real, please like the video. Tabitha gets out of the car and she sees what's going on. But for some reason, she's pretty quiet and passive about the whole thing. And then they look at the ravens in the sky. Now, real quick, I mentioned this briefly in a live stream, but I want to highlight it here too. I know a lot of people are wondering what or how it is that people get transported to From Town. I don't think the tree in the road is what transport you. I think it's actually the moment when people look up in the sky and they see the ravens. This doesn't account for Henry, who's knocked out in the back, but I think that looking up at the ravens is what transports you into the hellhole nightmare. Acosta talks about turning around and going in another direction, but the issue for me here is that I need Tabitha to do more than just whisper. Like, why isn't she kicking and screaming? She should be kicking and screaming, right? It's not just me. Tabitha's out here whispering like she's trying to tell someone about a surprise party, not literally trying to save these folks from certain death. Like, girl, where's the energy? You're about to drive into from town, not take a stroll down the block. Now, I get it. The writers are trying to mirror her inner struggle, right? Why is she so passive? It's because she's exhausted. Tabitha has been on her feet for dang near the whole time since she woke up out of the hospital and... She just woke up after being in a car accident. I get what they're trying to do. She honestly may not have the energy to put up more of a fight, but that's still really frustrating. We then switch to Ethan going through some new, shit, new, new, shit is me. new Victor drawings. These drawings are just pictures of what looks like Victor and Eloise in a tent. And before we get too many clues, the freaking phone rings. Ethan, like a curious kid who's been home alone too long, answers the phone. And surprise, it's his dead brother on the line, dropping cryptic life advice like, Mom's in trouble, so be brave, little bro. She's on her way in an ambulance. And meanwhile, I'm just sitting here like, Thomas, can you at least tell us what's going on, right? Like, if you're going to be calling like this, can you at least answer some questions? Jim catches Ethan on the phone and doesn't like it one bit. This time, Thomas refers to Jim as Jim, not dad, and then taunts Jim a little bit more just to rub salt in the wound. Jim asks Ethan what Thomas said, and Ethan shares the details about Tabitha in the ambulance. We then switch back to Colony House, where they're fighting to see who's going to draw the shortest straw and be forced to pick up the dead bird. Nikki is trying to get Bakhti to do it, but she ain't with the shit. She then gives Tilly a piece of her mind because it was her dumbass that was doing tarot readings in the first place. Donna breaks it up and then takes a second to check on Elgin. He claims he's fine, but my guy is weird. Elgin won't sleep, won't change clothes, and like, bro, right? We've been through a whole apocalypse and you still out here in the same outfit? The funk has to be strong. I mean, didn't you take a bath last season with your clothes on? What, what are you? Like a human sponge? Like, my guy is weird, right? We didn't switch to Fatima getting a house call from Dr. Marielle. They comfort each other over their situations with Marielle missing Christy and Fatima growing a demon baby. Marielle even notices that Fatima has been eating and... 
We then switch to Victor and Sarah talking about how Victor used to play in the house that Sarah lives in. And it's in this moment that we have our first confirmation that Eloise didn't survive when Victor mentions that she died. Just like Nathan. Except he didn't murder his sibling. Victor talks about how his mom, Miranda, tried to save everyone. But you know how From Tom works. She failed and everyone died. And now he's stuck with half-remembering nightmares. But he knows he's got to figure it out soon. Oh, and by the way, it's never snowed in From Town before. So yeah, we're heading into uncharted snowy hell as they go into the basement. We then switch back to the ambulance going down that familiar path heading into From Town. Tabitha, you're sitting there like it's an Uber ride to brunch while these EMTs are driving straight into hell. Sis, you gotta give me more. Kick, scream, do a somersault, anything. Because right now, it feels like you're auditioning for the Real Housewives of From Town. I am so mad at Tabitha right now. Catalina is a wonderful woman, but Tabitha is... <laughs> Acosta and the EMTs are out here all kinds of confused, while Tabitha finally opens her mouth just to give them directions, like they're on a Sunday drive to hell, since it's a bit too late for that now. We didn't switch to Boyd and Randall who are kicking it in the bus like they're waiting for a late pizza delivery. Except the pizza is monsters and plot twist, when they don't show up on time, you know they're bringing some extra creepy toppings with them. Randall's out here thinking he's the monster whisperer now, helping Boyd like he's been out there studying these creatures like a Discovery Channel special. I mean, sure, Randall, why not? Go ahead and throw in your two cents. Be helpful. We then switch to Christy and Kenny spending the night in one of the cabins. Kenny hits me in the feels when he shares with Christy that he's writing a letter to his mom. He says in Chinese culture, it's something they do on high holidays. And man, yeah, I'm not even going to lie. This hits hard and this is kind of inspiring. I'm going to try to write my mom a letter and see if that helps. Christy reminds Kenny that he's not alone. But then we see that Jade is actually still bunking with Kenny too. He then shares some of his poor man's vodka with Christy who needs it and OMG, Jade is going to share information. Yes, 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 yes. We then switch back to Victor and Sarah who are building a tent or fort in the basement. Victor tells Sarah about the night that everyone died when he was a kid. He talks about how Eloise didn't listen and didn't stay hidden in the cellar. He talks about how when he came out of the cellar that he saw the bodies everywhere. It was also the day that he met the boy in white. So we have confirmation at this moment that we've been seeing was the first time that he met the boy in white. He tells Sarah how the boy in white was his only friend for all those years that he was alone. But Sarah is still stuck on the fact that someone else saw the boy in white besides her. Victor talks about how he couldn't bury all of the bodies. It was just too much. And this confirms what a lot of us suspected with why Victor is the way he is. It wasn't always clear if it was this one incident, but Victor is letting us know that this moment was insurmountable in his mind as a child. Something happened to him in that cellar, which is why he was so filthy. And then he came out to find so much mayhem. He's just deeply traumatized. He even says that the boy in white was his only friend for years, so tack on the isolation as well. Rather than make him go even further into trauma of burying the bodies, the boy in white had him collect items that were precious to the residents so Victor could bury those instead. So wait a minute, wait, wait. What happened to the bodies? If Victor didn't bury them, what happened to the bodies? What did this boy in white do? Victor and Sarah go through his items and Victor explains that he wants Sarah with him because he might have to remember some scary things. And if he does, then he wants the scariest person there with him because they won't scare her. But let's be real. In From, scary is just another word for Sunday. We then switch back to Randall and Boyd with Randall pacing back and forth because the monsters haven't shown up yet. He then shares with Boyd that the monsters are creatures of habit and typically are there by now. 
He then talks about how the monsters have a pattern and walks Boyd through how the monsters typically just wander and play in the town after dark, but none of them have shown up yet. We then switch back to Tabitha, who's putting more effort into getting the people into from town than she was with trying to avoid going to town. Like seriously, it feels like she wanted to go back. Boyd and Randall see an ambulance arriving in town and so do Ethan and Jim. Ethan comes running because he knows his mom is in the ambulance. Boyd snatches him up and brings him back in the house. Ethan starts spilling the tea about that long distance phone call he got from Thomas. The ambulance sees a body in the road and the EMTs, following a sort of, you know, Hippocratic oath, do what they can to help and see if the person needs help. Tabitha finally shows signs of life and starts freaking out knowing that that is not a person. Acosta does the worst thing possible and handcuffs Tabitha to the ambulance. Oh, Lord. Now she act like she cares. Now when they're already here, I am so freaking mad. The EMTs make the worst mistakes of their lives when they walk over to the body and check for a pulse. And she goes all Wolverine on them real friggin' quick and starts screeching. Acosta learns the hard way that bullets aren't gonna help. Acosta is quickly surrounded but is smart enough to run. Tabitha starts getting some sense and tries to wake up Henry. Jim, once again, abandons his kids and makes them someone else's problem. Boyd ain't no babysitter and once again Ethan becomes the man of the house. Jim shows up just in time and reunites with Tabitha. Boyd and Randall aren't far behind but Tabitha is still cuffed to the car. Randall volunteers to get a toolkit to try to use it to free Tabitha. We then switch to see Acosta getting stalked by the monsters as she runs for her freaking life. She's firing shots everywhere but unfortunately Acosta is a terrible shot with one of the bullets flying through the window of Colony House and hitting Nikki in the damn gut. Damn. Man, I just realized that if you're an NPC in this show, you do not want to be named. If you are, all of a sudden, it's only a matter of time. Marielle checks her out and quickly realizes that the bullet is still in her body. Now, the folks at Colony House help the unwanted cop inside. Donna sees her freaking out and gets her to cut the shit and start answering some questions. Randall heads to the bus, grabs a toolbox, and boom, cicadas. Because, of course, this poor dude just can't catch a break. Randall's starting to feel like the universe is trolling him because apparently PTSD from Creepy Bugs is the special on the menu today. Randall admitted that the experience with the creature terrified him and it seems like it changed him. Not only was he whittling that wood skull, but he's somewhat helpful ever since. I wouldn't be surprised if this is his way of it extending an olive branch by being a team player. He heads back to help Boyd and Tabitha but gets intercepted by four of the creatures. Oddly enough, Woody the cowboy isn't there. Hmm. Randall proves once and for all that you can't just wave a talisman at the monsters for protection and all I can hear is my cousin screaming, pick up two for your mistake. Randall tries to head back to the bus but gets intercepted by some cicadas and hits the ground. Boy tries to find the keys of the ambulance so he can at least drive the safety but the freaking nurse monster has them and is dangling them in my guy's face and taunts him a little. She tells him to take the keys but they get to keep Randall. And that's when we hear that line from the trailer, you can't save them all. Boyd then finds himself going through his own version of the trolley problem. Boyd is in a situation where there's a fork up ahead. On one path, three people's lives are on the line. On the other, just one poor soul. Either way, it's a moral train wreck and you're the conductor. Welcome to the trolley problem, Boyd. Boyd reluctantly hops in the ambulance and starts the car. We then switch to Marielle who does her best to try to get the bullet out of Nikki and they pour some poor men's vodka on her to keep things clean. And my gosh, this season is freaking gruesome. Marielle pulls out the bullet. We then see Boyd pulling up to the front of Colleen House with Jim and Tabitha and Henry quickly running inside. Everyone, and I mean everyone, is shocked to see Tabitha because clearly word has spread that she went off into the woods and never came back. They start to settle in and yeah, I need to catch my breath too. 
We then switch to Tilly and Elgin, whom are low-key one of my favorite pairings on this show. Tilly is talking about how the bird coming through the window might have been a sign, but Elgin is too busy staring at the zombie kimono lady standing in the doorway to really even listen to what she has to say. Elgin follows the zombie into a hallway with the kimono lady, finally speaking and asks Elgin for help the we then switch back to creepy Ethan and Julie with Ethan still being creepy. He talks about how Julie is different now and wants to know if she's actually okay. And Julie does a terrible job at lying. Even Ethan don't believe her bullshit. Julie then tells Ethan how scared she is and how she's trying really hard to hold it together. Ethan wants to help but still is a little creepy in the process. We then switch back to Jade, Kenny, and Christy with Jade sharing his vision of the pilgrim guy that he saw in the forest with the rod in his eye. Surprisingly, it kind of seems like they believe him. Now, you know Jade is at his end if he's sitting there sharing information again. We've seen him do this with Tabitha, but he doesn't usually give many people the time of day, let alone let them in on what he's thinking. Jade has gone through a lot since coming to From Town. He saw the body under the boulder in the cellar. He saw the mannequin Jasper and a bloody symbol on the wall. He was chased and stabbed by an undead Civil War soldier. And that was after he found bloody pieces of other soldiers' bodies hanging from a tree. And the list goes on. He's not taking all of these visions too well, but he's still trying to use his intellect to try to figure this out. But the stress of it all is starting to take its toll on Jade. Let's not forget going loco Jade Herrera from episode one. Yeah, he's connected to something greater with the symbols and the visions, but he's also starting to lose his grip. It feels like he usually uses his sarcasm as a coping mechanism with people to mask the actual terror that he's experiencing about the entire situation. Jade reminisces about Tian Chen a bit with Kenny even admitting that his mom really liked Jade. He then encourages Kenny to finish that letter. Until they hear something moving around the town again outside the cabin, with Christy saying the same thing that I've been saying. Are you sure that thing you saw outside was a hallucination? We then switch back to Victor and Sarah with Victor starting to remember that day. You know the one where he collected all the personal belongings from the bodies like it was some tragic twisted scavenger hunt? The trauma is real, folks. He mentioned how one of the residents, Mr. Gerber, saw that there were onions growing wild in the woods and he would pick them and eat them raw. He had his watch. He had Dolores' cigarette case. Interestingly, there were some other children's toys inside the suitcase too, but there was nothing from Christopher. He talked about how Christopher saw the symbol and the guy started getting scary. He then has a little bit of a tantrum and then remembers what's missing. Christopher used to use the mannequin named Jasper that Jade sees from time to time. We then switch to Boyd and Donna catching up and Boyd admitting that he just freaking left Randall to fend for himself with the people creature monsters. We then switch to Tabitha and Jim catching up about how she found Victor's father. She also mentioned Miranda in the paintings with Tabitha talking about how she tried her best and thinks that she was sent there to see the paintings. Tapitha then starts to realize you that, you know you fucked up, I right? Fucked up, so you know what I'm saying? You're not fucked up now, you're not done. Because basically, she did nothing while in the real world, except bring Henry to From Town, which actually might be pretty important. I have a theory that Jim is the new Henry, and Henry had a role to play in this town when it was Miranda after Cromenacle. I'm starting to think that the roles are generational and the reason that Miranda couldn't save the kids in this tower is because Henry wasn't with her. But if Miranda is gone and Tabitha is the Cromenacle now, then maybe Henry is no longer needed? Maybe Jim can't fully realize his role in this game while Henry is still alive. Hold that thought. We then switch back to Nikki and Marielle and we realize that Marielle isn't anything near as skilled of a healer and Nikki bites the dust in front of everyone. This shakes Colony House to its core with Boyd beginning to go off on Acosta. Donna takes Boyd upstairs and we see Donna break down 
hard. I mean, we did see this coming for a while with Tana having some pretty explosive episodes, but this was the most intense breakdown yet. We then switch back to Victor and Sarah talking about how Christopher starting to lose it after he started to see the symbol. And Victor even caught Christopher talking to Jasper alone in the dark one day. And man, yo, this Victor actor is starting to grow to F up. Him and Ethan both look like they're about to start shaving any minute now. Anyway, that's not the messed up part. The messed up part is that Christopher wasn't just talking to Jasper. He was having a full-blown argument with the damn man again. And what's even more creepy? This mofo was actually talking back. What? <laughs> Victor says that Jasper is the one who can tell them what happened. We then switch back to Colony House with Ellis and some random moving Nikki's body into another room. Fatima follows behind and... Oh, God, no. Oh, no. Fatima wants to sit with Nikki's body alone, and I, I think I'm going to be sick. Look, I'm not going to stress this out. This demon baby has Fatima doing the most, with Fatima uncovering Nikki's body and then eating Nikki's body. Like, she is munching on her body like a kid at an all-you-can-eat sizzler buffet, munching on the chicken wings and mac and cheese, and... <laughs> this whole pregnancy with Fatima has been weird. First, she admits that she was never supposed to be able to have children, but we have no idea why. Then we see her losing teeth, and it's only been like two weeks of pregnancy or something like that. Plus, you, me, and Tilly caught Fatima eating garbage out of the trash. This whole thing has been deeply affecting Fatima as this town is now attacking the residents in completely new ways. It feels like everyone is getting tortured in some way, and Fatima is going through the most with this baby now making her downright cannibalistic. We then switch to Dada and Boyd toasting for better days, and then holy crap, Randall's back. They left his body on the hood of the ambulance, and this mofo is alive and end credits. This episode, yo, wow. Wow, I went through all the emotions with this episode. Tabitha is back with Jim, and neither one of them is even thinking about their kids. Kenny is writing a letter to his mom, and I think I'm going to do that too. Acosta is in from town now, and so is Henry, but Nikki bit the dust. And by all accounts, I think we're one person over quota now. <laughs> Randall would have been the one to balance the scales, but this mofo is alive. And Fatima, what the Fuck Fatima, really? And Jasper? Jasper? Yo, what the? The mannequin can talk. And he's already appeared to Jade back in season one, but Tabitha also saw him in the caves with the monsters. I think it's kind of interesting that Jade and Tabitha sometimes see each other's visions. But this one wild episode, they let Boyd live like they are nowhere near done messing with this man. I wonder if they knew Tabitha and Jim were in the back of that ambulance. If they did, I have a feeling that they would have took her ass out quick fast. But that's a wrap for Emily. This episode dragged me through every emotion. One minute I'm screaming at Tabitha, the next I'm wondering why Randall's still alive. And bam! Okay, so thank you so much. I'm so excited to speak with you, Angela. Um, it's, it's, I, first off, I love speaking with everybody that looks like me or looks like us on this show. It's like <laughs> one of the highlights for me, right? There's a lot of us out here and we're not going first. <laughs> um, so uh, I know that you have been involved as a member of the UBCP and ACTRA. Um, can you ask Trent? Actra, actra, actra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, it's oh, easier. UBCP <laughs> actra. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what your work is with ACTRA and the advocacy for BIPOC performers? Um, yes, in, I, I'm no longer a board member, mm -hmm. but uh, from 2018 to 2023, I served on the executive board of UPCP ACTRA. That is the autonomous branch um, of ACTRA in Vancouver, BC. And then we have a national organization, ACTRA. Right? We have two different union agreements. 
So UBCP Actra deals with our own agreement here within the province of BC and the Yukon, and Actra has an independent production agreement for the rest of the country. So it's a long story how it ended up that way, but that's, that's the difference. Um, and so when I joined uh, as a board member, I was elected, and I realized that how important it was to be uh, invited to the table, so to speak. Um, um, there hadn't been anybody who looked like me to, uh, at the board table, the executive board table. So it was really important for me to bring forth the issues that um, BIPOC proof members had. Um, and it was apparent that no one had similar experiences. And so um, when there was, uh, when there was, um, for example, um, discrimination on set with one particular network and um, a non-union member had gone forth to the news about it, um, I realized then that we had to step in and do something. If it happens within our jurisdiction, then it affects our members. And I felt, thought it was, you know, um, really incumbent upon us to step up and really start looking out for the best interests of our BIPOC performers. And so it went sort of uh, something um, from that to um, hair and makeup equity, which is a huge issue amongst all BIPOC performers all around the world, actually. Um, and so we've had uh, numerous discussions that you can find on YouTube um, and SAG-AFTRA has also had the same discussions. You can find those on YouTube and even some international ones in the UK and Europe. So I became very heavily involved in that. For um, I've been a performer for quite a, a long time. And when I first started, I used to bring my own makeup to set because um, I was never really assured that they would have my shade, uh, uh, and if they did, you know, it, it, it would be sort of, you know, insufficient. So I'd always bring my own custom blended stuff to set, uh, so I at least I knew they would have the right shade for me. And I would also get my hair done before I started my job, before I, you know, went to set, because also um, there weren't many stylists, well, there weren't any stylists that could... Um, that could do my hair. So, um, yeah, so those things kind of have existed for decades and um, BIPOC performers have just dealt with it uh, up until recently, um, along with, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, these sort of conversations started to come into more of the foreground, right? And I really believe that something had to be done because there was an inequity there, right? Yeah. Um, if I get hired to, you know, go on a show, but they don't have craftspeople who can do my hair and makeup like my, my counterpart sitting to my right, that's not right. And that's not fair. Um, and even when we went into negotiations, it was still an uphill battle to have that acknowledged um, that producers, um, they're the ones who are creating the workplace. They need to hire people who are competent, um, who could do, um, you know, hair and makeup for everybody not just one subsection of the population so that's the work that i you know was really passionate about and um it was brought to the the attention of our national organization and luckily the executive director there marie kelly and eleanor noble who was um the president of actra um really took this to heart and marie kelly filed a grievance in the province of ontario with the um with the Canadian Movie uh, Pro Producers, Motion Pictures, sorry, uh, Canadian Motion Pictures Association, she filed a grievance with them to say that, uh, you know, you're not providing the same, the, you know, equitable services and you need to do something about that. Uh, and from there, um, we have found a great growth, uh, great conversations. The, um, even the team at UBCP Actra, our, our own committee, our own BIPOC committee, had discussions with the craftspeople from the IATSE, that's the hair and makeup people, mm -hmm. um, to let them know the damage that had been done with our performers and what they could do to rectify that. So all across the country, our union has brought forth um, guidelines, um, protocols, uh, lists of equipment, <laughs> 
everything we could do to say, here is the information. You need to become better skilled at your jobs, right? So that when I come and sit in the chair that I can relax mm -hmm. and know that someone is competent to handle my hair and someone is competent to handle my makeup um, and I can go to set feeling great and fantastic, just the same as my counterparts. So that is the work that I'm, you know, really passionate about. We're still, we're still bargaining for these things. Uh, we're about to move into um, negotiations, mm -hmm. uh, the American and the Canadian side. So um, those are some of the things that we're actively working towards to get them entrenched within our union agreements so that our performers can feel confident when we're working with our fellow craftspeople on set. Um, I have also had conversations with crafts people who are, who have acknowledged this issue. They are upgrading their skills. They're going to classes. They're becoming better educated. Uh, they are hiring um, uh, BIPOC uh, artists that are not weren't even a part of the union. They're giving them opportunities to be, become part of the union um, um, because they're already skilled. They were just underemployed, right? So they're becoming, you know, so they're becoming a better crafts uh, guild so that they can work with our performers and we can feel confident um, and beautiful and uh, that everything is equitable, right? So, um, yeah, that's something I just feel really passionate about. I'm, I'm no longer serving on the board, but I will always be interested in supporting and advocating for performers in that regard. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Look, you're, if you're making a change to make sure that, you know, BIPOC performers look the way they feel confident, that is a big mm -hmm. help for all of us, right? It's going to make the actors' performances a lot easier. It's going to make everything better. Um, I know I've yeah. had this conversation with, uh, with Tracy Ellis Ross, and she's talked about this a lot. I'm curious, from your perspective, you know, when you were a member, but when you were a member of the board and even beyond, do you feel that there have been any strides for BIPOC performers in re recent years, or do you still see the industry falling kind of short? Um, I would say definitely within the last four years, myself as a performer, I've had increased opportunities for roles. So that's the, the really great thing. And I've been at this business a really long time. Um, and so for the most part, uh, my roles were kind of on the periphery of the storytelling uh i played more nurses than i care to <laughs> than i care to mention right um or police officers i mean i mean i enjoyed them you know i enjoy working with people um but for a while there that seemed to be all that was available or i would actually just wait to see in the breakdown african canadian or african american in the breakdown and then i knew that i would have a shot at that on occasion I would uh, go up for stuff that didn't mention any particular ethnicity and sometimes I would book that and that would be great. But that was more the exception. Um, I'd say within the last five or six years, it's really changed quite a bit. Um, and there's just a lot of opportunity to be series regulars, uh, to be guest starring, like having bigger, meatier, juicier roles, part of the main storytelling. Um, and we've also had a lot of, um, you know, BIPOC filmmakers are coming forward with their own stories, you know, uh, whether they're, um, uh, you know, uh, Asian uh, uh, Pacific Islander uh, stories or indigenous stories um, or, you know, the black stories, all sorts of different stories are now coming forward. And I believe that the more different stories that we can tell, we really raise the bar in the excellence of this industry, right? Everybody's story deserves to be told. There's so many commonalities as we strive in this human life that we all need to just sit back and just open our minds to other perspectives, right? There's much more in common than we have than, than, than there are differences. Mm -hmm. And when we get to have those stories told, then we get to be in charge of changing the narrative. Amen to that. So... You know, during your time on the UBCP Actor Executive Board, and it, it sounds like you've been exposed to a lot of things that might be challenges for BIPOC performers. Can you let me know, like, what are some of the most significant challenges that you might have faced for pushing for systemic change? Or 
if there's anything that, you know, people like me or audience members can do to help. Um, I think really the main challenge was to um, get allies to really acknowledge and listen. I think that would be the main thing. Um, every, I mean, I, I, I believe that most people are good on this earth, right? Um, but sometimes when it comes to challenging the perspective and how they do things, that can be a challenge, right? They don't often see, like, say, you know, racism or discrimination or things that are systemic until you point it out to them, mm -hmm. right? They think it is the exception or they think that certain things are just discrimination if it's really egregious, right? And that isn't the case. Uh, particularly within this industry. A lot of the stuff is just like microaggressions on the daily. Mm -hmm. On the daily when you go to work, right? So I've had many performers reach out to me, EMM, like, talk to me, DM me about something that happened on set. And most of the time we feel disempowered to actually do something about it. So um, part of addressing that is getting allies to really stand up and be aware of these things. So that, you know, I mean, if, if I were to make a complaint about, I don't know, something, well, everybody knows it's me because I'm the only black person on there, mm. right? And an actor doesn't want that kind of attention, right? You just want to be able to go to work, do your thing and go about your business, right? We don't want to be worried that we're not going to get hired again. We're going to be thought of as difficult. I mean, that's already a huge issue uh, to be a, a black uh, female performer in this industry. Yes. Any request that you make, any any sort of, uh, you know, thing that you're asked to do and you don't want to do it, you're seen as being difficult, mm -hmm. right? And that you have no rationale to want to ha go, have things go differently, right? So it's a really um, uh, big consideration for our allies to actually be aware and stand up and say something. If you are number one on the call sheet, if you are the producer, right? It's really, you know, really beneficial if you actually stand up and say, how can I, you know, help you? How can I better serve you? How can I help this situation? How can I make you feel more comfortable? Um, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, it can be the, the higher ups, uh, like the producers that, you know, are part of the problem, right? So you need somebody on your side to just speak up for you and just point out some things that may not be obvious to other people but it's quite obvious if you're a person of color um, that you're, you know, you're really being transgressed upon, right? And like I said, you know, everybody wants to go to work and be, you know, um, have it be free of harassment, right? That's part of the privilege you have as being a union actor is that you want to be able to go to work and have it be free of harassment, whether it's sexual harassment or racial harassment. You just want to go to work and have a good day. You're not mm -hmm. looking to make any trouble. But you are, you know, you can be made to feel very uncomfortable in certain circumstances, and you have a right to speak up, and you have a right to have a safe and respectful workplace. Thank you, thank you for that, and thank you for highlighting that word "difficult." Right? I know that that's a word that can be used as a label for people. To I think I heard it primarily. Will Smith mentioned it with, um, I forget her name, Janet, and it, it 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 brought that word to the forefront of people's attention. So thank you for bringing awareness to that word and how it's used. I'm curious though, mm -hmm. um, what advice would you offer to like maybe younger BIPOC performers who are just now getting into this industry? And, you know, we know that this industry has been slow to address issues of, you know, representation and inclusion. Like what advice would you give them when first stepping on set to navigate this world? Um. I would give them the same advice as I give to any performer. Be excellent at your job. Be excellent at your job. I was kind of raised in an era where I, I had to mind my P's and Q's. I had to watch what I said. I had to even watch my face, <laughs> right? Um, sometimes I'd just be sort of sitting there quietly thinking whatever thoughts and someone thinks I'm in a bad mood, right? And that's, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing anything, I'm just thinking my own thoughts, right? Um, and so I, I always tell young performers, I go, just be really good at your job, you know, be really good at your job, be confident at your job. And if you see, uh, anything that is, you know, making you feel uncomfortable, you know, check in with someone, check in with one another, um, make sure that you are safe, uh, reach out to your union. If you're a union performer, 
um, to make sure that, you know, your rights are respected when you go to work. It's a really, really difficult uh, environment in order to speak up for yourself sometimes. It really is. So, uh, you know, really rely upon your colleagues. Um, sometimes you kind of feel like you're being, you know, uh, gaslit, right? Um, and, you know, you have to follow your gut and your intuition, um, and you're not, right? But I think you just need to find out what your rights are, you know, uh, get solidarity with your, your fellow performers. And if you don't have it there, go to your union, you know, go to your union rep. If there's something that's really troubling you, talk it out with somebody, you know, I think you have just have to practice saying certain things um, in order to be heard. I've had to be very, very mindful with my language um, because, you know, I'm, I'm not there to hurt anybody's feelings when I go to work, but I, I'm also not there to take the brunt of someone's ignorance either, right? So I have learned to kind of speak up for myself, um, be, you know, I have to be mindful about how I say it, but I do had to practice that. I really did because you just feel uncomfortable. You know, I think what people forget is that unless you're really, really well known, um, actors are not like, sometimes we're kind of on the bottom of the rung, <laughs> right? When we actually go to work. I know it seems really odd, but sometimes you are when you have directors and DOPs and, they, you know, it's production is a huge deal, right? And so they often just kind of think of you as a widget to produce their product. Um, and on occasion, you run into other people who, you know, you know, believe that you, you know, that you're really important to part of the storytelling. And then sometimes you run into people who don't actually treat you that way. So learning to stand up for yourself. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, then reach out to your colleagues and um, just have someone to talk to. Uh, I think I know a lot of performers who've reached out to counselors to talk about some of the stuff that they've gone through on set. And this isn't particularly true for women. So they get their support offset um, with counselors to deal with, you know, whatever situation they had to deal with, right? So, but don't be silent about it. Don't do nothing about it. Um, even if you don't want to say anything at the moment, um, go, go and tell somebody, you know, when it's safe to do so. Um, call your union rep, right? It's a little harder if you, you're not a part of the union because you don't really have anyone to go to. Um, and that's the kind of the benefit of being a union is that you have you have other resources at your disposal, right? But please talk to somebody. Um, I think sometimes just being heard is part of it, right? I I totally get that. You know, in recent headlines, you know, we've seen things like uh, Amanda Lestenberg go through all sorts of attacks online for her performance and her role uh we've hear, heard john carlos Esposito talk about how at one point in his career he was thinking about hiring a hitman just so his family could get the insurance money because he was you know having a really hard time with being able to afford his, his to make a living wage i'm curious though mm. like in in the work that you do with the ubcp and actra board was there a any particular impactful moment in moving the needle toward more equitable opportunities or environments for BIPOC actors? Like, what what is that effort like? Um, just generally speaking, it was exhausting. <laughs> it, it was exhausting, and it was uh, one of the reasons why I um, decided not to run anymore. Um, it takes up a huge amount of my time. Um, and, um, you know, I'm an actor, uh, I'm unemployed, <laughs> so I really have to hustle for work. You know, um, being on the board is, um, you, you get an honorarium, but you don't get paid a living wage or anything. Right. So, um, all of these things, um, they're, they took a mental toll on me. I have to say, um, I found it really, really exhausting. So I just thought, you know, I'm going to take a break. Um, I don't know if I'll return, but I just needed to step back and take care of myself, uh, and, and yeah, it's, it was emotionally exhausting having to explain things over and over and over again. 
um, and also to not have things prioritized, right? Um, when, when the times are tough, most people's attention goes to, oh, we have to take care of this first, right? Like COVID hit, it changed the whole industry, changed how we worked. And then it's, well, we just have to worry about COVID. We just have to get through this. And I'm like, no, we still have to talk about equity. We still have to talk about representation. We still have to talk issues. Um, and sometimes people didn't want to do that because they didn't see it as important. Um, but I, I never believed that. Even in times of COVID, who's, there are a lot of people who are impacted, but people of color are also um, really impacted, or have been really impacted by COVID, right? So people kind of forget that. Right. So even when times are tough, the talk about equity and representation should never disappear from the table. People think, OK, well, we solved that. We solved that. We had these shows. We're done. Um, no. I don't believe that. I always believe that um, those things should continue to be talked about and um, goes back to the conversation I had about having different stories being told and who gets to tell those stories. Right. Um, all of it really is about just raising the excellence in our community and in our storytelling, because as as performers, the, we are the storytellers for um, our humanity, really. Right. I mean, look what people depended on during COVID. They depended on Netflix and a whole street. They just said they watch TV and, you know, whatever. They turn to the artists. Right. So I think we have a responsibility to really speak up when we, we create stories and or become part of other people's stories. Um, I think that's really important. It's always been important, like, um, for example, in the, in the Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very much a culture that's rich in storytelling, um, and they should be well represented in the story so that we can learn about one another, right? But where we came from or the land in which we stand upon, uh, we should learn about those things. Those things benefit not only our humanity, our um, our place in the world, but also for our children, right? This is part of our shared humanity, right? That should be celebrated, right? Not oppressed. It should be celebrated. Totally agree. Um, with with what you're what we've seen you in recently, right? Like from, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious. In what ways do you think the current landscape of Canadian film and television compares to Hollywood in terms of meaningful roles and visibility for BIPOC performers. I, I'm pretty sure From is a Canadian produced show, right? It is an American produced show that's filmed in Canada. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 how do you feel that it compares in your experience, at least as far as offering meaningful roles uh, for BIPOC performers in both ca Canadian produced shows and American produced shows? Mm, um, not specifically talking about from, but when you, your initial question is about the Canadian versus American, right? Yes. Um, I think, well, sometimes it's a question of numbers, right? Uh, of all the people, like, you know, California, the amount of people that live in California um, is the higher population of Canada, mm -hmm. right? So we're a really huge country, um, but with not as many numbers um, of people as there are in the States, right? So I think when it comes to talking about, you know, representation, I think in a, in a lot of circumstances, their Americans are far ahead in a lot of ways, right? With the amount of stories that they tell um, that come from a um, sort of more diverse perspective, right? Um, and also uh, there's more money and a tradition of, um, you know, well, Hollywood, right? Um, so there's more money here in the States to do that. However, the Canadian film industry is also quite powerful. Um, and I think they're, um, particularly in particular urban centers like, you know, Toronto and Vancouver and Halifax, they're really growing their, their, their filmmakers, their diverse filmmakers, um, so that they can feel free to step forward and tell their own stories in that way. So they're, they're really completely different uh, on the scope 
right, on the scope because of the nature of our countries, right? So um, more particularly talking about from though, um, we have a very diverse cast, so that's fabulous. Um, we have um, Catalina Marino Sandino, um, you know, she's uh, uh, Latinx, Latina, and we have Harold Perrineau, um, mm. uh, you know, he's our, you know, also one of the leads. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you just sort of look at the whole cast, you can see, you know, and Ricky, he, you know, Asian, you know, performer. So, um, so we have a little bit of taste of everything. And I think it also represents sort of all of the different storylines of people, you know, coming to from, mm -hmm. they come from all different backgrounds, right? Um, and they're coming from all different walks of life. Um, so it is a, a little bit about, you know, America, right? In this small town. So there's all different sorts of people in from, um, and they're just part of this crazy, horrible thing that's going on in town, right? Uh, it's been a real pleasure to really delve into the, all the characters and all the, the storylines and the LGBTQ storylines that we also have, right? So there's also that perspective as well, right? So that's what I really love about this show is that everybody has a chance to tell their story from whatever perspective that they have. Um, and it's not seen as something sort of exceptional, you know? We don't always have to talk about, oh, well, I'm the only gay in town or something like that, <laughs> right? Like, it, they, they don't have to talk about it. They're just living their lives, right? Um, or I'm the only, you know, black sheriff in town or, or you know we don't we don't have to talk about it they're just being themselves under these exceptional circumstances right and that's what i mean about you know representation um it's not always talking about the differences it's about leading these human lives right trying to survive all the monsters and all the craziness that happens in this town um and that family is not only family created, you know, or your family of origin, but the family that comes with trying to survive with strangers under difficult circumstances and supernatural circumstances. Yeah. I, I, you know, I love this show. I love the diversity. Yes, I do. Show. I love everything about it um, that I've seen makes it, 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 even if it's not said to be exceptional, it feels exceptional to me just because of what you said, right? All of these different backgrounds from all of these different people. I'm curious, you know, without giving away too much, what can you, what can fans expect from your character, Bakta's return in season three? And how does she fit into the broader narrative of the, you know, of the town's mystery? Um, that's a good question. How did she fit? Um, what can we expect in season three? Um, I believe that we'll just see a different side of Bakta. Uh, when she first arrived, um, you know, she's pretty surly, right? Um, kind of like, what, what, who are you? Get away from me. That type of thing. Right. She's used to being in charge. She's driving her bus. She's trying to get things done because in her mind, it's her last ride mm -hmm. before she goes off on vacation. She has a whole other life that she wants to get back to. And the circumstances are preventing her from leaving. So in season three, okay, well, we've been here for a little bit now. And how is she adapting? And I think that you'll find, you'll just see another side of Bakta that you didn't get to see before in season two. Um, Just out of curiosity, would you be able to share any memorable behind the scenes moments from filming season three that maybe helped deepen your connection to Bakta or the From storyline? Memorable. Hmm. I think they were more along the lines of... Um, like horrible, horribly, <laughs> right? <laughs> to tell you the truth, you know, um, when I when I first came uh, in season two as a performer, and um, I got to see one of uh, uh, another actor, and he was, but he was dressed as a creature. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was kind of terrifying. <laughs> it was really creepy. Uh, you have to understand that I didn't see uh, season one until I got to Halifax. Okay. Um, when I was cast, I didn't know because MGM Plus didn't show in Canada. So I didn't really see season one. I just saw a trailer. So 
when I arrived and they were walking, this gentleman, you know, um, and he was kind of, oh, it was horrible. Uh, so I've seen a lot of really terrible special effects. <laughs> um, and I also remember um, when Bhakta comes on the, the bus and she sees these passengers that have been murdered. Well, in my mind, I was going to see some sort of special effects dummy. Mm -hmm. Right? So I fully expected to walk up on, they were going to call action, but they were going to have kind of like, you know, the stuff there. Yeah. And there wasn't anything. There was nothing. And I was completely, I was like, uh, hmm, can you talk me through this? And the director <laughs> said, okay, come and we shot some other stuff. L look at this stuff first. So we had a bit of a, you know, a talk. And I was like going, oh, okay, that's what it looks like. Because I wasn't sure exactly how, what kind of uh, state that they had been, you know, they had been left in. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to see that so I could give a really good reaction. Oh, boy. But I think that was the one thing sort of I got upon the interaction and there was like nothing there. I was like going, okay, is that part of a head or is that part of a bot? Like, how? Uh, <laughs> I, I just needed a little boost, you know, but so I had to put those visuals in my head and then um, kind of react appropriately and in character. I mean, how does one react to seeing somebody guts being pulled out? It's, you know, would you scream? Would you be quiet? Would you just have your mouth hung up? Like, it's so... I think that was the sort of the memorable thing for me was just sort of walking on that bus and going, oh, okay, there's nothing there. What, what does, how does one react to a corpse being, you know, cut open and, and shredded? Uh, so that was my kind of my memorable experience. <laughs> well, you, you did a great job. You did a great job. You're definitely one of my favorite characters to look forward to. It looks like you're taking Yay. over. I, I don't want to accidentally say anything, but I'm I'm really excited for fans to see your work later in the season. Um, yeah, thank me too. <laughs> thank I, I just wanted to say, though, I, I really enjoy the, the, the cast. They're amazing. You know, Ian and Harold and Catalina, you know, and, and Liz. And I, well, I, I kind of run out of names because there's so many of them. But the most talented performers... And every time I'm around them, I just feel so grateful uh, to have this opportunity to just play in this crazy world. All the stuff that John thinks of is just kind of twisted. So there'll just be a lot more of that in season three. I'm I'm so excited. Hopefully he'll let us know why this show is called From, because I, I still don't know. <laughs> don't ask me. Well... Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I know you're very busy. I've, I've taken up so much of your time. I wanted to thank you so much for all of your efforts on the show, especially all of your efforts in the UBCP Actra. You know, that that to me touches me more than anything else. Anyone who's advocating for BIPOC performers to have, you know, equality in the industry is way more important than anything we're talking about. So thank you so much for all of your time and effort to that. Um, you're you're very welcome. It's my true passion, and um, it it just it, it's my way of of uh, giving back to the community. Um, I didn't have that coming up in the in you know in this business, and I wanted to leave it a, a, a better place, and I think I have, and and you know in my in my little small way. I mean it's it's not something that one does, but you know by themselves. I had a whole team behind me. I had a whole committee behind me. I had members behind me. It's not something that one person does. Um, a lot of people have to be part of this effort, right? And there's gr there was great solidarity um, with my union colleagues, and I'm just so grateful to have them in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I hope to speak to you again in the future. Thank you so much for this. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. Okay. Bottom is out here with the nightmare fuel. I'm definitely going to need some sable bourbon after this one. But hey, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell so you're not left in the dark like the poor souls in From Town. And don't forget, if you don't subscribe, the boy in white might just show up in your nightmares. That's all I have for this one. I'm going to check you all later. Peace. <laughs>